Very cool. So types and methods of research. We're going to talk a little bit about the different um, types of research that you'll encounter on the MCAT. Um, but first, we'll talk a little bit about uh, error and bias and how we can avoid it. So when conducting controlled research, it's important to take steps to reduce error and bias. Um, it's really impossible to avoid them, uh, but we take steps to control them so that we can get the most accurate results. So an experimental study should be double blind and randomized controlled. Uh, two terms, if applicable, um, they help to reduce this error and this bias. So a double blind experiment eliminates, that should say, any subjective bias the subject or the researcher may carry. Neither of the two know if they are administering to the control group or experimental group. So normally in an experimental setup, especially if you're talking about like a clinical trial, you'll have two separate groups. We'll have the control group. Um, they're probably getting the current standard of care. So if we're talking about, say we're talking about a new flu vaccine that's on the market, the control group would have the best flu vaccine that's currently on the market. And the experimental group would have the new vaccine that is trying to get FDA approval. Um, the double blind means that neither the subject or the person that is administering the vaccine knows if it is a control vaccine or an experimental vaccine. So that eliminates bias from both standpoints because you can have bias on both standpoints. If, uh, if the subject knows which is which, um, the expectations could skew the results and it's the exact opposite. If the person administering it knows, they could be giving you know, verbal or nonverbal cues, things that are tipping off um, the subjects in those two different groups. There are, are a number of ways that, uh, that uh, the study could be affected negatively. Um, and a randomized controlled experiment is just one in which the experimental and control groups are picked at random. Um, so that eliminates like sampling errors. Um, FDA trials use the current standard of care as a control group. If the new treatment cannot be proven statistically better than the current standard of care, it may not get approved. So that's one of the, one of the hallmarks of FDA um, approval and testing. Um, and we're going to go a little bit into the different types of studies that they'll talk about. They talk a lot of about studies like this on the psych and social uh, the section. So you might even encounter some passages regarding studies like this. So case study is a type of observational study where the researcher follows a specific individual uh, with a remarkable or unusual condition. So it's you're following one individual through time and you're sort of just taking their account of say a disease or some sort of condition. It's not really um, a, an experiment where we're trying to establish a cause and effect relationship or we're even trying to find statistical significance. It's just a case study. It's just an observational thing where we are watching this study and we're just gathering information from our observations. So it's great to use um, for like future, uh, like to spark more questions and to guide future research, but it doesn't definitively or conclusively provide results. Um, it gives insight and it sheds light on the lesser studied conditions. So I'm sure you know about, uh, you know, a bunch of different case studies. Um, Sybil, if you've ever heard, was um, one of one case study that was pretty popular in mainstream media. She had uh, reported conditions of dissociative personality disorder. So that was one case study of the 20th century. I think it was later proven to be kind of not valid, but it's a popular example. Uh, case control study is a type of study where the researcher takes the subjects with the remarkable condition. So the person that we are watching with the case study and matches them with a negative control subject. Um, so that would be if we are trying to study how, you know, life is affected by someone with a rare skin disorder, instead of just doing a case study on that person and how that person navigates their environment, we would then find a control group, maybe someone who lives a very similar life to this person, everything except that disorder, and we would compare the two and we could draw um, a little more insight maybe about how specifically the study, um, sorry, how specifically the condition is affecting the life of the person. Um, but just like a case study, it can't really provide concrete evidence because we don't really have a large enough uh, sample size. Um, to provide statistical significance. So moving on, we have cohort study, which is a longitudinal study that follows a group of individuals, which uh, we refer to as a cohort and samples the data through time. So it's kind of like a case study, except we're looking at a group of people now. It's a cohort study. And longitudinal just means that we're following the same, the same data of interest throughout time, the same set. So it could be we're following a cohort throughout time. The case study means we're following an individual throughout time. Those are longitudinal studies. Longitudinal meaning long through time. 
Um, so cohort studies can be useful in establishing cause and effect because we're watching their actions play out in real time, um, but they can be expensive and they can be time consuming. So it's very difficult if you have a large cohort, if it's about a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand people, the more people you introduce into it, the more possibilities for error it is. Um, you have to pay them more. It's time consuming because you have to check in with them. Um, subjects sometimes might not be super consistent with what they're asked to do or with what they're asked to report. Sometimes they'll drop out before the study ends. Um, so all of this contributes to the uncertainty of the final. Um, but I mean, they can be useful if they're done um, correctly. So we have correlational studies as well, which is a study that provides evidence for the association between two variables. So if you look at that picture at the bottom, um, it just shows three different types of I guess three different types of outcomes you would have for a correlational study. Um, R is the correlation coefficient. So if it's a positive number, that means that they are positively correlated. If it's negative, they are negatively correlated. Um, and if it's close to zero, it, it really means that there's no correlation at all. Um, and you can even see it on the graph. So the closer that R gets to negative one or one, the stronger the correlation becomes. And when you're talking about correlation, it's very important to remember that correlation does not prove causation. So you have two variables that are occurring at the same time or that one is increasing and one is decreasing at the same time, but we don't have enough evidence just from a correlational study that can prove one is causing the other. So if we just see that two of these variables are increasing over time, it's impossible to, to, like, to prove causation without an experimental setup. Um, it's just saying that these two things are happening at the same time, one could cause one, uh, vice versa, or an outside factor could cause both of them. Um, and as we said before, R is the correlation coefficient, and it can tell us if the correlation is positive or negative, or if there is one at all. Um, so it's not, correlational studies are not used uh, for cause and effect um, discovery. It's just used to find associations between two different variables, which can be extremely helpful in and of itself. Um, so we have cross-sectional studies, which um, are studies that sample data from a population at a given point in time. Cross-sectional studies may utilize different samples at different points in time to collect data, whereas longitudinal studies would follow one sample across time. So if we are conducting a longitudinal study about the skin disorder that we were talking about, we're probably going to see that there's a progression of this disease. Maybe it starts out very mild, um, and then you know, 30, 40 years later, it gets very advanced. So a lot of times in medicine, we'll split it up into stages. Um, a longitudinal study would follow this cohort along the different stages, whereas a cross-sectional study, we would get a group that's in stage one of the disease, analyze it. Group two of the disease, analyze that. Group three, all at the same time. So that's why we're calling it cross-sectional rather than longitudinal, because we're not following it through time. We're sort of just stratifying it based on the progression point of what we're interested in studying. Um, and survey is a research method used on human subjects as a way to extract subjective data about one's experiences or opinions. So um, I'm sure you've all participated in surveys. Some of you might have even conducted surveys. Uh, we're just gathering subjective opinions and experiences. Um, so when reporting, subjects may introduce error into the data if they are not completely truthful. Um, obviously, there are some studies that have shown that when it comes to certain topics, people will under or over report certain behaviors, um, certain ideologies, stuff like that. Um, and though the respondents answers are generally regarded as true, small inaccuracies can lead to large errors during data extrapolation. So it's important to keep that in mind that when you're looking at surveys, if you're trying to extrapolate, which means you're trying to create new data and make new interpretations based on what you have, um, you do have to take into consideration that a survey is only as accurate as the people that are answering it. Um, so experimental studies, which uh, is a general type of study that a few of the ones that we've talked about already probably fall into the category of. Um, but these are just the studies that establish cause and effect relationships between independent and dependent variables. So we said before, correlational studies cannot establish cause and effect. If we find from a correlational study that there is an association between two variables, then we can set up an experimental study. Um, a lot of times correlational studies are quicker 
and easier because it's usually just taken from a pool of data that we already have. And we can see that there's an association between these two variables. And then once we can see that, um, we can plan and design an experimental study to actually analyze the cause and effect relationship. We might find that one causes the other, or we might find that a completely different thing causes the two, um, but they don't have a cause and effect relationship between each other. Um, so the independent variable in the experiment in the experimental study setup is what the researcher is manipulating and it's conventionally graphed on the x axis so the the dependent variable is what we're interested in seeing change and it's graphed on the y axis so that's what's actually changing and what we want to see change so for example if we're trying to see different sports drinks would make seeds of a plant grow faster than water we would set up multiple pots maybe and we would feed them different sports drinks we would maybe have a control group with water um, the type of sports drink would be the independent variable because that's what we're manipulating. That's what we're, we're manipulating to try to find a different outcome. And the different outcome that we're trying to find is the growth, which we can measure in the height of the plants. So the height of the plants would be the dependent variable. So the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. We're changing the independent and the dependent will change accordingly or will not change accordingly if there's no relationship. Um, yeah, so definitely, definitely know the difference between independent and dependent variables for the MCAT. Uh, we have clinical trial studies, which is a type of randomized group experimental study that compares a new intervention or treatment to a placebo or current standard of care. So like other experimental studies, clinical trials can establish a cause and effect relationship. So clinical trials obviously are done for FDA approval. Um, and FDA approval, the way it goes clinically for the clinical phases are broke down into three. Before they even get to the clinical phases, they test on animal models. And if it seems effective and safe, then they start phase one. Uh, phase one studies the safety dosing and metabolism of the drug in a small group. So it's normally about 20 to 80 people. Um, they'll try it on uh, you know, different, like different diagnoses they'll try it for, and they'll see if it works and if it's safe. Uh, once it passes phase one, I think about a third of all of the experimental drugs that um, get to phase one actually pass it. Uh, once they make it to phase two, it's a study for the efficacy of the drug um, compared to a control group with a slightly larger group of people. So now after we uh, move from phase one, we're studying actually how well the drug works. So it's a little bit bigger of a group and we have a control group now. Um, and if it seems like it's actually doing more than the control group, then it moves on to phase three which is the statistical significance trial. So this is hundreds, usually thousands of people. And um, the studies are being done on a large scale. Um, and the control group, again, is the standard of care. So we increase the group because we're trying to prove statistical significance now. We increase the sample size. So if it is stati statistically significantly better than the current standard of care, um, it moves on to the next phase and it will probably go on to be approved as a new drug. Um, the entire process can take several years to complete and very few experimental drugs will actually make it past all three phases so years it could take like five years seven years um, but it's good to have some background on how that works because i've seen it talked about i mean you never know what's going to pop up in your interviews when you get um when you get to applications okay so we're going to review again, take a minute, read this. All right, so 25% of you said A, no one said B, 25% said C, and 50% said D. So 50% of you did get it right, the correct answer is D. So let's go over it. Um, a student in a high school chemistry class is watching and recording the half-life of a substance by recording its relative concentration in a solution using a spectro, uh, spectrometer. So the student observes that without interference by other factors, the concentration of the substance is cut in half approximately eight minutes after the start of the experiment. Identify the dependent and independent variables in this experiment. So remember, um, the independent variable is what is being manipulated or what is changing, and the dependent variable is what is changing because the independent variable is being manipulated. So the dependent is what we're interested in seeing change. So the student observes, um, I'm sorry, wants, is watching and recording the half-life of a substance by recording its relative concentration. So when we're looking at this study, we're going to be looking to see how the concentration is changing because that's what a half-life is. It's how long a substance will break down um, 
into 50% of its original. Um, so if it takes eight minutes for 50% of this substance to remain, its half-life is going to be eight minutes. So how do we, how do we tell that? We take the starting concentration and then once it gets to half that number, that would be the half-life. So we're just recording the concentration change throughout. Um, so the concentration change really would be the dependent variable. So let's look at A, the dependent time, independent substance concentration. Um, time is not a dependent variable. Time is never really a dependent variable. Um, if someone ever finds a way to make it a dependent variable, then please let me know. Um, the B, dependent light and independent time. Uh, time is definitely an independent variable, but uh, we're not really doing anything with light in this study. Um, it's possible that light could affect the half-life, but it was not mentioned in the question, so you shouldn't pick that. C, the dependent is substance concentration and the independent is light. Substance concentration would probably be a good guess for the dependent variable, but independent, again, light. Uh, we didn't really mention anything about light in the experimental setup, so I wouldn't choose that. Um, but D, the dependent substance concentration and the independent is time. Uh, is the correct answer because we're looking to see how substance concentration is changing over time. So another way to do this is that if you think about what the graph would look like, pretend you're you're conducting this experiment and then at the end of the day, you have to hand in um, a graph with your results. What you would be doing, your graph, you would set up concentration on your y-axis and you would set up time on your x-axis. You would draw the line plot and then wherever it was at 50%, you would find the time and that would be your half-life and that would be your answer. So time is on the x-axis because it's the independent variable. The dependent is substance concentration. It would be on the left, probably be in molar. And that's your dependent variable on the y-axis. 